Good evening and welcome to our Practicing Synodality webinars. My name is Avril Bajant and I'm co-director of a new project, the School for Synodality. The school aims to take the idea of synodality, which can seem so abstract, and turn it into simple habits and practices that we can all take up to help our communities become more listening, welcoming and outward looking. We began our series last week with Dr. Jesse Rogers, exploring that foundational question, what is synodality? We had a fantastic conversation exploring how we'd seen synodality impact our communities, why some people are so worried about it, and why Catholics keep quiet about the Holy Spirit. It's a great conversation. If you missed it, you can find it on our YouTube channel or on the webinar page on our website. Tonight, we get very practical indeed. A feature of our Catholic community life of recent years has been a breakdown of trust between different kinds of groups, between lay people and clergy, between priests themselves, between church leadership and everyone else. You only have to go on social media, which I don't recommend, to see that breakdown of trust writ large. At the same time, there can be good reasons for that lack of trust. The sex abuse scandal in the church, financial improprieties, relationship breakdowns, polarisation. So tonight we're thinking about power and trust, leading, facilitating and creating safe groups. I'm joined by two guests who spent a lot of time reflecting on this. Kiran Beery is a facilitator and mediator who's worked with groups all over the world, including for the UN, and is also chair of one of our pastoral area councils, so he knows the church from the inside as well. He is going to reflect on his experience of synodality from the perspective of his work practice. Father Kevin O'Driscoll is pastor of a very diverse parish in Slough and co-led our Diocesan Reaching the Margins project, which was part of our wider synodal listening. He's going to reflect on his own experience of being a priest in the synodal process and the learning from the Reaching the Margins group. Kiran, Father Kevin, good evening. It's great Hi. to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. The format of our evening is that we will chat on this topic for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions. So if you're watching this live, please do use the chat to say hello and to share thoughts and questions. But for now, before we get started, we'll start with some prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, we thank you that you are working so powerfully in the church through this synod process. We thank you uh, for the, the prayer that's going on in Rome at the moment with the global synod process. And we thank you for the, all that you are doing in small communities up and down our country. And we thank you for this time this evening, for our conversation. We pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit on us to inspire us to be able to speak boldly and listen graciously to one another. Be in all that we do through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, Kiran and Father Kevin, thank you so much for being with us. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and um, I'm just wanting to um, ask you both just, um, oh, this is the unscripted bit. I ran through all the questions with you and I'm going to ask you to say two minutes about something about yourself, something about yourself and what it is that's interesting about this topic for you. So, Kiran, would you like to start? Something about myself. Um, so, um, uh... I don't know. I'm a grandpa. I, I um, enjoy my life immensely. I enjoy um, my engagement with the church, and um, and I guess um, I, I guess for me, what makes this whole process interesting is is I, I absolutely am a firm believer in the need for change, and this is helping to support the change that we desperately need within our church. Thank you. Thanks very much. Look forward to unpacking that a bit more. So, Father Kevin, would you like to say a word or two about yourself and uh, what it is that interests you about, about this whole process? Good evening, everybody. Yes, my name is Kevin O'Driscoll. I'm a, a priest, a parish priest, in right in the south of our diocese of Northampton in Slough. You know, they talk about sometimes um, lucky footballers or lucky football managers I'm a lucky parish priest I've I've always thoroughly enjoyed the parishes that I've served in and I've been here in Holy Family for over 20 years now and um, I'm incredibly happy here um, 
And, you know, I, I, what I'm finding interesting about this synodal process is even after many years of being a priest, um, it's really sort of making me reflect on, on, on lots of issues, but I'm not scared of it. I, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of this synodal process at all. I'm, I'm welcoming it. I think it's something incredibly positive and um, I, I'm just enjoying it. And uh, I hope that is something that I can communicate this evening as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and definitely, it definitely comes over in all the ways that you do talk about synodality. So, Kiran, just turning to you for a moment, if we can, um, I've described you as um, having um, a career as a facilitator and a mediator. Just wondering if you can tell us something about issues of power and trust that you deal with professionally all the time. Yeah, so so I work globally. Um, I work um, in in the whole area of conflict resolution, in mediation, and in really just, I mean, people often ask me what I do, and I say, look, really, I really just help people to have better conversations. So um, so I work in the area of of um, of, of conflicts and post-conflict in conflicts and post-conflict countries, and also in the whole area of international development. And that can include um, working with people who are conflicting or groups that are conflicting, um, but also working with people who've just got themselves tied into knots and um, and don't know where to go to or get stuck or have disagreements about how they're going to, for instance, initiate major projects or, or, or start to resolve new ways of working together. So, um, so that's kind of what I do. The reflection on that for the synodal process is it really speaks to, resonates with me in terms of um, what I do in my working life is about just that, just helping people to have better conversations. And the synodal process for me seems to try to do that. And, uh, and I think what's important for it to continue to learn is some of the barriers that exist in people engaging with the process and wanting to come and, and have those conversations that are needed. What are some of the, um, the issues around power and trust that you have to kind of overcome when you're dealing with these kind of different groups of people who don't want to talk to each other or, you know, sort of, <clears throat> just, you know, what are some of the, the baseline things that you have to think about? Well, we have lots of parallels, by the way, in the church as well, but so, some people just literally been told they have no voice. Yeah. Um, some people actually having no voice, but that's a very different thing, isn't it? So, so, so having, having no right to say anything, other people feeling threatened and, and, and unsafe to say things. So the whole school of psychological safety has taught us so much about building, trying to build safe spaces for people to have conversations. But you come across, I'd come across lots of people who, who don't feel safe or don't feel allowed to be involved. And then there's another aspect as well as there's, there's the aspect of, of individuals actually not believing in themselves or even groups not believing in themselves. Um, can we do this? Are we allowed to do this? Yeah. Um, do I have permission to stay? Yeah. And, um, and I see those parallels in, 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 in the church as well. Yeah. Will we be allowed to do this? Is this, am I allowed into this group? And then also, also, Avril, people have had damaging experiences, just as you talked at the start about damage at the start and how people have felt damaged by, by things. People felt damaged by entering groups, yeah? um, by putting their head above the parapet, by saying things and getting put down. And, um, and they've also been in groups that have been um, decidedly uncomfortable for them. Yeah and where they felt marginalised by other people. For instance, you know, you feel marginalised, you must feel marginalised time and time again if you're in a group that votes and you lose the vote every time, yeah? Or actually, if you're in, in a situation where you, you, you don't actually have the vote, yeah? Um, or you're not allowed to say, um, or where you are 
in some ways told by the the society you live in um, that you don't have a right to speak up. Yeah? Um, so, for instance, I work um, in situations with lots of um, lots of women's groups in different countries where 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 women have have traditionally not had a voice and therefore trying to find a way of of assisting people to believe they have a voice is 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 is, is a feature of what I do yeah? and and I see those parallels exactly in the synodal process when where people won't join or didn't join because they don't feel engaged or in fact even where groups didn't even start because people didn't want to hear them and and that we heard that last week didn't we on, on the call last week so you have so you have those situations arising and i guess i guess for me the important thing is us us finding ways to teach people how to believe in themselves but also teach people to be able to to think about how they can come together and assert their voice mm, absolutely I mean, for me, one of the really interesting things about the Synod process is that it's been quite a different way of holding conversations and and that, um, but that there's kind of cynicism and weariness from the past and that people have not wanted to get engaged because they've had a bad experience or they say, well, I, you know, I got involved before and nothing mm -hmm. happened. And so I think, I think you're right. I think that there, there's a experience about people not knowing that their voices were welcome or not knowing that we wanted to hear from people and so they sort of excluded themselves from joining in yeah well we heard this last week as well Avril. but you if you take we took the the, the the term being people being frightened was was mentioned last week yeah and if you if you take if you take the word fear and you look at the mnemonic of that it's false expectations appearing real Hmm. And lots of people hold those false expectations. And what we have to do, if those of us who are really interested in this process, is to find a way of unpacking what those false expectations are and helping people to, to challenge their own thought process. What could happen? You know, what, 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 what won't happen this time that happened last time? And, and you know, and one of those things is, we said it all before, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. We won't be heard, yeah. Uh, why does my voice count? Yeah. Um, and what we have to do is to be absolutely demonstrable in demonstrating the results of, of the synodal process so far to allow people to be able to, to talk. Yeah. So so in in my work, we've got to do that as well. And and, and in my work as well, I guess one of the other things we have to do is to allow people to learn, which again is a feature of synodal process, is to learn to have better conversations. Yeah? And a lot of people go into conversations and, um, and um, uh, they, they listen to judge. Yeah? Mm. In, in conflict, we have to stop, we have to try to shift listening from judging into listening to understanding. And, um, and the same process happens within synodality where we're trying to allow people to listen to other people and hear their point of view and, and, and have a way of trying to understand that point of view. Yeah? Um, and I think we need to spend much more time um, helping people to unpack that and what it really means to listen to understand and what it really means to to have those conversations that work but in in all forms of work in, in all forms of of group work particularly it's about shifting the frame of listening to a more appreciative a, appreciative inquiry a more curious way yeah mm. Thank you. My goodness. So many fascinating questions that you're raising there. Um, I'm just going to say to people, if you're watching live and you've got, I mean, it's not very often we get a world class mediator and facilitator that we can just chuck questions at. So if um, if you've got questions that you would like to ask Kiran um, or Father Kevin, just stick them into the chat and uh, we will pick those up um, at about 10 past eight. So, Father Kevin, if I can turn to you, um, 
I just want to ask you, um, what's it been like for you as a priest um, in the middle of this? Because I think one of the things that um, came out when we got those documents, those original documents from the Vatican, and we were trying at pace to figure out how on earth does the diocesan bit of this work, that somehow the priests were they kind of weren't overly mentioned in the middle of it all. There was a process. We had to get on with the process, you know, and and I, I think that the the role of the priest is almost a little bit ambiguous. Um, and so I just wondered if you'd like to talk about you know, how did you find yourself in the midst of all of that? Yeah, I hope I don't meander too much now. Um, well, what I found is um, I, I, I've, it's, it's pushed me into lots of questions and lots of reflections on my uh, priestly ministry over, over many years. Um, and 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 I think probably the first question is is that that, that connection between leadership and, and power. Um, when I came here to Holy Family, for instance, um, almost the first thing that that we did was. Um, reorder our church and um and and I had to take the lead on that and that's perhaps a big example but there's all sorts of ways that as parish priest I'm expected to take the lead and yet what is that uh tension what, what, what how, that can be abused as well as used very positively if you've got energy and ideas and so forth um, it can be used, and sometimes I think it's, you know, perhaps leadership is 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 is, is missing sometimes, um, and so I'm quite happy to take on that role of leadership, but I've become more more and more reflective about it, and um, and for me, it's perhaps. Uh, made me reflect and I, I, I don't I'm not sure I've got lots of answers makes me reflect on perhaps, perhaps two particular areas where power uh, can be exercised um, positively or quite damagingly the two areas I'm thinking of is first of all preaching and um, I think I was very fortunate when I was in seminary that the priest who talked talk to us about homiletics and he did something that, you know, I've reflected on many times. He says, um, by every sermon, you condemn yourself. Hmm. So I think the longer I've been a priest, I've tried to sort of, um, in, in my, my homilies, to, to speak to myself in the first place um and 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 why because i stand in front of a whole group of people who are good people and working hard and they're there on that, that saturday or sunday and 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 who am i to sort of hector them in any way i mean encourage inspire i hope um certainly break open uh, the gospels but um, to somehow Hector, I think, is, 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 is not my role. And I just, in my reflection, I just hope that I've grown in that, in, in that idea. The second one is uh, the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which is an incredibly powerful um, experience. And uh, I think a priest, how do I put it really? I'm just reflecting now. Uh, priest has got to treat it incredibly carefully, um, what is said to people. Um, uh, it, it's got to be a healing experience. It, it's, it, it's got to be an encouraging experience. Um, so I, I think they're the two areas, Avril, that I've sort of reflected most upon, uh, plus that whole thing about leadership. Hmm. Thank you. And 
I think we saw quite a lot of those issues coming up in the the, the reaching the margins project as well. Um, so um, I mean, so just to quickly explain for people, this was a project that was part of our a response to our diocesan listening, um, where we realised that we had tried to encourage people to listen to the margins, but we'd been rubbish at it. Um, basically, we weren't very confident, and we didn't really know how to do it. Um, and so Father Kevin and our um, Caritas lead, Deacon Jim Hannigan, cooked up between them a project um, to try and reach, to be much more intentional about reaching beyond our usual people, um, to try and reach lots of different kinds of groups. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a bit more about how that went. Well, funny thing, Avril, is, is my experience is not so much of power, of powerlessness, really, that I, I just... It, it it didn't work. We, it, Jim and I worked extremely hard and contacted lots and lots of people that we, you know, we didn't we didn't assume that they were on the margins. We asked, you know, do you feel on the margins in any way? Would you like to talk to us? And nobody did, or next to nobody did. Um, there was a powerlessness there that somehow we we we've we've gone a you know it, it's it's a long journey back a long journey back we somehow somehow seem to have uh even even though i think we speak the language and everything like that of welcome and so forth i think people just didn't particularly want to talk to us and it was quite frightening quite frightening um that people didn't and and, and we mustn't give up and, and we must I think in some way figure out some other way of seeing why people um you know don't want to be part of us anymore but it certainly wasn't a feeling of power by any means so we should just explain to people that um um one of the couple of the things that you did first of all was you sent out lots and lots of you you shared lots and lots of leaflets with stamped dressed envelopes on the back which and you asked parishioners to take them away across six churches across our diocese wasn't it, it was it was yeah. a considerable yeah. effort yeah. um and ask parishioners, please take these away. Please give them to somebody who might feel like they're on the margins, who might like to have a conversation. And there was a big old deafening silence. And I, I do remember the meeting where we had where you guys were saying we failed, we failed. And I said, no, you know what the conclusion that we came to was, no, no, it wasn't the method that was wrong. It was that the people were so kind of removed from the church that they didn't want to talk to us they didn't want to take up that opportunity they weren't interested they were a long time gone um was i think what we what we found but then you also did a survey didn't you across your your parishes in slough you know, through a sort of fairly simple survey we we surveyed about a thousand people on one particular weekend um and it was interesting, really, in, in one sense. We asked simple questions. Why, what, you know, these were the people that were at church. Why do you think your loved ones um, don't, um, you know, don't want to be particularly part of us anymore? Um, and it wasn't terribly conclusive. Uh, some of the answers were quite practical ones. People are tired. Uh, people in this part of the world there's an awful lot of shift work they just want some time with their families at the weekends if that's possible um, there wasn't an awful lot about um, uh, being disgruntled at what this or that priest might have said or, or done to them it was more sort of practical things about getting out of routine and and and, and just wanting to spend time with their families really mm. Mm. thank you I I, I I found that whole project fascinating and I have to say that Jim said to me I'm still having phone calls so although those leaflets went out um yeah. and they I think for some people it's taken six months almost to build up the confidence to 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 phone in or to get in touch and, and say so he he has had I think they they're building up over time but yeah some very interesting very sad stories sometimes about about powerlessness and not not necessarily with clergy with all with family and all kinds of things but kind of related to being catholic yeah so kiran i just want to um return back to you and and just to say um 
how how can we deal with these issues of trust and power in our synodal processes? Um, you know, so what were some of the, I know that you did facilitate training, for example, across um, your whole pastoral area, didn't you? What were some of the sort of things that you'd learned from your work that you were helping us to understand better? So I think, first of all, the, the most important thing for, for leaders and facilitators to learn is how to do it well. Yeah? And, um, and, and how to not do it well, but how to, how to be as a facilitator and a leader. And we learn so much, don't we, from, um, from, from the School of Servant Leadership around that we are, we are there to be of service to people. Yeah? In my work, if I feel I am there to take power um, instead of I'm there, here to support and to encourage, then then I lose it. Yeah. If if the synodal process is one where where the leader decides to tell people what to do, it's missing the point. So the facilitator or leader needs to really truly get that and understand it. Yeah. Um, there is a there's a wonderful book called the um, the the servant leadership styles of Jesus Christ that I would recommend to everybody to read and. It, really explore, unpacks the, the kind of thoughts on servant leadership through through how Jesus worked in in in, in our world yeah um so so I would, I would very much recommend that to people but servant leadership is, is about is about that whole concept of being of service so that's number one yeah um number two is um is is really kind of having groups understand having leaders and facilitators to understand what are the dynamics in the room? What happens? You know? um, we are all wonderfully diverse and, and, and we are a part of that dynamic. You know? so, so for instance, when I work in, in Africa, I have to recognize straight away, Avril, look at me, I'm white. You know? I, 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 I represent um, in many ways colonialism. And I have to really demonstrate that that that's not me, you know. Um, almost, almost, you know, that, that I'm 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 not there to tell people what to do or to be a, a sort of an expert that says you have to do it this way. It's just some suggestions about how we how we're going to do things. Same way in in, in the synodal process, leaders have to understand themselves. Number one, understand the others in the group. Yeah. So understand diversity and understand different issues. Like in, in one group I worked with recently in a, in a church, we explored, for instance, we explored our behavioral diversities and everybody in the group did um, a psychometric profile to understand how, how beautifully different behaviorally everybody was in this group, besides the fact, besides their gender, their ages, their, their their preferences, whatever they may be, whatever what whatever beauty of diversity people were bringing, so leaders need to get that, and um, and then they really kind of need to in, in, for long term groups, they need to really truly understand um, both group dynamics, how groups build and develop, you know, um, but also how to create safe space, and that's absolutely critical that. You build trust through safety. Yeah, you would never build trust through power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So understanding your power dimension is understanding yourself as a servant leadership. Building trust is building safety, and um, and safety for some people takes a long, long time. I mean, Kevin just talked to us about about the the difficulty of getting people to respond. Well. You look, just imagine, just examine some things they, in, in our country and, and across the world. How long did it take the Me Too movement to grow? Yeah. Years. Yeah. And when it built momentum, it started to, to be able to say something. Exactly the same as with, with Black Lives Matter. There were some incidences that caused that to, to be voiced. And now it's been voiced more and more. Yeah. Um, um, but we need to get that and understand it, yeah. And, and then, then leaders and facilitators have got to to learn to be intuitive about what they're working with, 
with the dynamic that they that they have sitting in front of them, and then learn to to be intuitive of the people that are in the room and how how to help them and how to bring them to into that conversation. Because some because of our diversities, we'll all be different how we enter the conversation. And mm-hmm. for some people, it'll be frightening. For some people, it will be easy peasy. Yeah. And some people, it's actually too easy. And then they frighten the people who are frightened. So, so you just have to really try to work with that well. One of the things I, I think about the um, um, the spiritual conversation patterns that we had um, that they we, they were helpful. Um, although I I mean I'm increasingly thinking that synodality is simple but not easy, um, and that actually there's a there's a fair amount of skill in just being able to facilitate one of those spiritual conversations. But in it, there were some things that helped. I think there were some things, having read accounts of this done elsewhere, that didn't help. But some of the things I thought that did help was that that first round where you heard from all the voices, and, and I found that it was often the people who might only email you two days later in other circumstances or might never say anything. Actually, they might go last, but they would actually say something, which I, I thought was helpful. And I also really liked the don't jump in thing of, you know, like you you that whole shift that you talked about earlier, I found very helpful. That listening, it's a different, it's all, we need a different word for it, I think, because we're not listening like I'm listening to my children telling me about the day while I'm cooking tea and thinking about an email that I need to write. Well, I, you know, I am paying attention, but I'm doing three things at once. But it is that kind of real attentive, attentive listening that I think we, I mean, we ended up with people in tears saying, I've never been list, I've never been heard like that before. You know, it was, it was so, so powerful. Um, I think where I where I've seen it not work so well was where it was very rigidly held to and people, you know, you may not speak uh, and, and you know, you may only say one thing and you may only speak on the, the, the question that has been asked. And, you know, that. Um, and so I, I think there's probably a, a sort of midway that, that helps. But I just wonder mm. what, you know, what were some of the things you found about that that that, you know, would be helpful for us to take away? I think it's really useful to to allow groups to 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 build their own ground rules so they own them. Hmm. So they, they so so they talk about what does good look like by the end of our meeting and how we're going to be together to get that way. Yeah? And it's useful for facilitators as as we had is to have some guides for some of those behaviors um, so that maybe you could you could suggest them if they weren't coming from the group. Um, but really just try to build those, 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 those ground rules with the group and then really help them to, to, to be that, like that. But also talk about, talk about what it is to listen curiously and listen to understand. And, and, and that means you have to try to help people to change the frame of how they normally are. And that's why it's good, for instance, Adel, as um, people were entering this room today, to listen to some music or to to do something different, to to pray, to be silent. Um, um, In the groups that I work with, often I play music as people are coming to sit in the room and I sit with them quietly before we start. Um, In in some different groups I work with, um, for instance, um, some beautiful things I experience with people praying and um, in some meetings I go to if the first prayer is is a Muslim prayer the last prayer will be a Christian prayer and that's beautiful experience to be in because there's always this wonderful um oh who prayed first oh it was it was it was you so let's let's do another one and um and and so so that they're nice but 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 and what I'm saying is to prepare that frame yeah and to get people comfortable in the space always to make sure that people can see each other, okay? Um, So round circles are normally preferred. I really prefer that people sit in circles so that they can can see things. Not over PowerPointing people. Mm -hmm. Death by PowerPoint really doesn't help. Um, um, But setting the frame and then really getting people to think and talk about, before you start, what it is to listen to each other, yeah? And, and then get people to think about 
then, then try in some ways as a facilitator to personalize this. So when you think about what people have said, how will you be different in this group today? Yeah. So that then people start personalizing to themselves. How will I listen differently? How will I listen to understand? How will I not jump in? Um, those things that we've agreed to, how will we live them? Mm. Got some great questions coming in as well at the moment. We'll get to those in just a minute. So keep them coming because that's always really interesting to find um, where people are um, curious. And that leads, Kiran, say more about listening curiously because I think that's a really interesting concept. So listening curiously or um, um, is really about truly trying to find out and to engage with the person who's talking. So, so comes from the School of Curious Inquiry, um, where, where, where you learn very much to, to never interpret what somebody says, but to ask them questions so you can understand it. In, in so many conversations, we, 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 somebody says something, and you immediately think, well, they're saying that because they think this way, yeah? And, and sometimes you internalize your own answer to that question because that's what you wanted to hear, yeah? Um, so so be, being curious is to, to stay with the question until you understand what that person says and, and really truly understand it. And, and really, honestly, you know, you have to practice to do that. You know, um, I, I know I'm a real busy person. And, and I have to, I know in my practice, I have to slow myself down to make sure that I listen properly. Yeah. And, um, and, and, there, and, there, and I have to truly, my head is going off in all sorts of different directions. What's next? What's going to happen next? How this group's going to move next? But I have one person talking with me, and I have to center on that one person and truly understand her and listen to what she's saying to me, and then ask her maybe ask her some questions to clarify that, and then rephrase that back with her. Say, "Have I got it now?" Uh, and then she may say, "No, Karen, it's this." Okay. Now have I got it to be able to understand it? So it's about me genuinely, absolutely genuinely wanting to hear, or about you know us genuinely wanting to hear and know what the person is saying. Hearing and knowing are really important, yeah. Um, and then then just being conscious of yourself, what you do, yeah. Um, so on one on one calls, I often have um, even a little post it pad in front of me with, with, with a little note to myself, Kieran, remember you're listening. <laughs> so, 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 and it's so important to me to remember. And sometimes I would write that person's name, Kieran, some, remember you're listening to Anna or you're listening to Ngozi or whatever, whoever it may be, I'm listening to somebody and I have their name in front of me. So I remember that that is what I'm there to do. Mm? Mm. So powerful, isn't it? Just so powerful. Like in this world that we're living in where the conversations are often flying past each other we're making snap judgments on people um we're trying to get something done we're trying to achieve something you know just give me my blooming prescription <laughs> don't yeah. care that you're having a bad day i just need to get on to the next thing um actually to have that time where somebody is honoring your experience and i mean i, I that's something which i found really rich about this is to say my goodness, you know, that is not my experience at all. Like I, I've never felt like that about that thing, but tell me more because I want to know why you're so passionate about that. Do you know, that's tell me more like the, why does that, you know, why, why does that mean so much to you? Um, and I've found those really, even when somebody's from a perspective, I do not get at all just to I, I ask those extra questions has been very powerful because then at least I can understand their perspective because pretty much everybody's got a story, haven't they, as to why they feel like that. And often it's quite an emotional story as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and it, it makes so much sense once we really think about it and we say, well, what are the things that um, 
that that I know about myself, yeah, um, and the way that I listen that will make me change, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, yeah? Um, and and um, and just um, there's there's the way the way of being in a space to 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 allow change to happen means that sometimes we have to slow down ourselves. Yeah. Um, the wonderful book written by a, a, a lovely woman called Nancy Klein, and she says one line in her book. And was, this was I mean, she says many lines in her book, but this was this was the line I found most powerful. She said, um, and this is a real good message to the synodal process. She says, she says, there's so much to do. We have such little time. We must go slowly. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And, and for some of us who are, I am, I'm horrendously changing patient. I know that. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, and that's not giving my, myself an excuse to be changing patient. So what I do know is because I know that that's how I lean. Sometimes when I listen to people who are much slower in, in, in change, I have to get into their gear with, so that, so that I can really understand where they're coming from with it. And that's critical. And that's, again, a feature of understanding diversity. Mm. Father Kevin, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to leap in and ask you to, um, to join us here and just say, you know, when you hear Kiran talking about this stuff and, you know, your own experiences of change and your own experiences of synod in your parish, you know, how, how does that resonate with you as a parish priest and, you know, sort of in, in that role? Well, I think, you know, as Kieran was talking there, um, I, I was just, if I could go back to that theme of leadership a little bit, you know, that, um, you know, I, I don't think leadership is is a, is a, a role to be shirked. I think, you know, you know, when the bishop sent me to, here to Holy Family, he, he, you know, wanted me to, to lead the parish perhaps in a different way that, that had been led before. Um, so I think there is, you know, it's not to be that, not to be frightened of that, but um, what I found myself in, in my years here that, that I I've, I've seen examples of really good leadership, really really good leadership, and I'll give one example without mentioning names. We had a school that was very, very vulnerable 10 years ago. Now it's a school that so many parishioners want to send their children to. Um, and it comes from the leadership of, of the head teacher. And, and I've just tried to observe some of his, the ways he does it. It's, it's about energy. It's about ideas. But it's about bringing people with you as well. People with you. And I think that's what the synodal process is, is, is sort of articulating a little bit, really, you know what I mean? And I think it's interesting that in that first listening experience we had in the church, one of the, um, one of the things that came up an awful lot was people's powerlessness when a new priest came. That, 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 you know, that, that, and if, if I'm trying to be practical at present, uh, what this synodal process is is pushing me to do, I think, is to um, make sure that people have channels to to have good conversations about parish life, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I've got to sort of uh, you know revamp our parish pastoral council to be much more a synodal experience, our finance committee to be much more a synodal experience. But more than that, to, to, to find groups that perhaps have felt that they, nobody's going to listen to them, they, you know, <clears throat> if I give an example, um, there's a group in our parish, a group of Polish women who are meeting for a synodal conversation next week. And I think they've been absolutely amazed that I want them to do it. You know what I mean? That, that, that what is their experience 
our church and you know and I think many of them why it came about because many would say to me you know that, that, that they have no say you know what I mean they're, they're, you know there's I, I won't go into it but but th that sort of idea so I, I, if I just say again, I, I'm not frightened of this synodal process at all. I think it's complicated in the sense that it, it's it's not as light on its feet as, as somebody saying, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this. But unless we bring, unless we involve people, I think, in conversations, um, I, I think we're, we're in danger of things just being swept away. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think if we are learning different ways of being community together, that is not quick. You know, it's like um, in a family or in a workplace, you know, if you're trying to do things differently, it takes persistence, it takes clarity, it takes vision, it takes somebody saying, yes, that was good. <laughs> Oops, that didn't work. Never mind. We'll try again. We'll have another go. Um, and it, it, you know, it it does. I think it it isn't quick, definitely. And I do keep on saying to people, synodality is not like magic fairy dust. You know, you don't sprinkle it on and and discover. Actually, what you can do is open a Pandora's box, and you can you can let out a lot of old hurt and pain and grief that's been sitting around for years and years. Yeah. And and then all the time being pushed back as, as somebody who's a priest, you know. What, what is this leadership role what what model are you are you you know what is your instinctive way of doing it how do you need to change as well you know i think is 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 is, is the challenge but you know i i don't know avril you would know more are am i are priests scared or, or not scared you don't have to answer that now but I, i'm not scared by it you know <laughs> Thank you. Well, and it's great to hear that. I think I think people are in different places, given their different experiences. And I think that that can be really interesting. And um, I want to just turn to the questions now. because we've got some really interesting ones. Um, and so Alex uh, was talking about the hurt from the pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, people had very different experiences in different parish. I have to say that Holy Family, which um, I haven't, didn't actually say an introduction that you two are in the same parish, so <laughs> we should really say that. <laughs> and if it's a good conversation, it's because these guys have spent a lot of time talking to each other. Um, Holy Family was one of the quickest off the mark in terms of getting things online and getting out to parishes and connecting. You really, you, I remember the, the Good Friday service that you guys did online that we joined you for from our living room, very weirdly. Um, but Alex um, says... Um, there was a lot of hurt from the pandemic, you know, where, you know, people were in places where, you know, there was that awful moment in March 2020 when we realised we didn't even know the phone numbers of people who'd been come to mass for 30 years. You know, we struggled to reach out to them. And, you know, and, and so he's saying, you know, to what extent do we think that that negative experience really has led people then not to, you know, to have those reasons, Kiran, as you said, you know, I'm not going to engage with this. They weren't there in the pandemic. You know, I, I wonder what you uh, what you think. Um, Kevin, you're nodding away there. Yeah, um, I, I think there is something of that, Avril. Um, you know, I had one particular experience where... Um, a lady in my parish died and the family were very angry that um, she hadn't been looked after. I, I had, to, you know, it was very hard not to become defensive because I didn't know she was ill and nobody phoned me up and told me. So, so there was some unrealism about it. But I, I would say that, 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 that certainly, you know, there must have been something about people being uncared for, uh, not, not not connected with. I think lots of parishes try very hard, but uh, I, I, I would suggest that, uh, yeah, I think that might, might well be the case. Mm. I think in terms of lessons learned, certainly as a diocese, we are putting more of an emphasis on things like just better communications, aren't we? And better, you know, so putting, we didn't, you know, when you've got all your parish emails on a spreadsheet, 
<laughs> or a, a church kind of census that was last done in 2009, which I think was the case in our parish, you know. And it, it, so I think I think we're trying to get better at that. But I I do agree, Alex. I think you know that. And I, but also I think the the big synodal process came out of that experience because you know we remember Pope Francis standing in the rain, the driving rain, giving a blessing to the world. And saying we are all in the same boat now, you know, brothers and sisters, we are all in the same boat and that you can read that impulse to synodality back into that sermon where he's he's talking about how the world we have to change. We can't go on like this. And um, so I think it did, I think it did both things there. I resonate with that question. It was a, it was a time the time to step up, wasn't it? And um, and 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 so. So it was a time where, where, where churches could have really stepped up because people were hurting, people were lost, people were frightened. And, um, and to be able to, to continue to do things then as much as was possible, yeah, um, the, the churches need to, to, to examine, are we doing what we can do? Yeah? And, um, and I think on that examination, some will say yes and some will say no. It was also a time where there was a huge amount of innovation. I mean, I've been working in the church all my working life, and I have never seen the church change as quick as it did in that six months, you know, just in terms of live streaming, there were online retreats, there was this, that, and the other going on, stuff was springing up around the diocese, you know, it was a, there was a sort of a move. I think then there was perhaps a sort of an exhaustion afterwards. and. Mm. and I feel like we've snapped back to the 2019 too quickly. We we didn't say mm-hmm. what lessons did we learn? You know, how how could we carry on some of that innovation? You know, how could we carry that on? Um, but it felt to me, oh, this is possible. Do you know, like we can we can reach people in a different way. Um you needed to get lucky with the skills skill set that you had. <laughs> and when, and I, you guys had that. I, I, I think there was something very positive came out of it, that if you were sitting in front of a screen, as I was sometimes saying mass in this room where I am now, and not quite sure who was, not, not being able to see who was participating, it certainly sharpened me up on my homily. I <laughs> no, I did not wing it at all, I tell you, yeah. <laughs> you didn't know if the bishop might be watching. <laughs> no, not so much that, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um. So... Um, another really good question. This is really for both of you. And I, uh, um, so Peter Farrell asks, how do we as a church encourage leaders to become facilitators? Um, so do you want me to go first? Go, go, can, go. Yeah. So um, encourage, I think we need, I think, Peter, we need to train people and we need to suggest that there is a formation process um, in, in leadership. And, and help people to understand that and help people to understand that leadership is 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 both is both um it's, it's a privilege to be a leader um but it's also a huge responsibility and um and therefore buying that responsibility to 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 facilitate or, or bring groups together is is a skill that that people need to learn it's not something you just just rock up and say I can do it. Yeah, it's also a dreadfully lonely place. So so leaders have got to find ways of communicating with each other and learning to mentor each other, so that um, they can talk about the difficulties they have, as well as the positives. You know, in, in my work, we 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 regularly meet as groups of groups of facilitators to talk together about what it is like to what we do, what are our successes, what are our challenges, what are the things we find hard. And we need to do that in leadership groups as well. So it's not just a question of training people, it's a question of supporting and mentoring and coaching people and having a space for them to understand it. But in, but in training them, they need to really understand the skills of leading well. Mm. Kevin, what about you? What do you what do you feel about well, that? Sorry to go on about leadership, but but I think um, part of I think my leadership model, my leadership way of doing things, but well, it starts off from a from a, 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 a an attitude that I 
I speak to people weekend by weekend, um, talented, talented people, skilled people in, in all sorts of walks of life. And I've never been frightened as leader to actually ask people, would they be interested in doing, doing such and such a thing? Uh, I think it's important things about it. You've got to give people the opportunity to say no and, and, and not feel that they not make them feel guilty about it if they say no, if it's not them. But I think I think some talent spotting is 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 very important in parish life. I I have seen you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot of people are frightened of doing that. They, they, they're quite frightened, um, but I, I, I'm not sure they should be. As long as you give people the opportunity to say no. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is a, a mindset, would you say, Kiran? It's a mindset that you're going in, you're thinking I'm going in, this is a kind of facilitative form of leadership that I'm operating. Um. It's not necessarily a, mind, a mindset, yes, possibly, but it's actually a belief that that is the best way to do it. And, and it's certainly a belief that, that it isn't about you being powerful. It's about you supporting and, and caring for the people that you're, work, you're going to work with. Yeah. So, so and, and that, that's critical. Yeah. Sarah, um, Adams actually gave us a lovely example of um, Timothy Radcliffe, um, master or um, now probably retired master of the Dominicans, but um, who is giving the retreat in Rome at the moment. So they've got a three day retreat to, to start off before they go into the synod properly. And his um, talks are being publicised. And the one that I read this morning is absolutely fantastic. Um, um, maybe we can put it in the either we'll put it in the, the chat or we'll put it in the, the notes that go out after this. Um, he starts off by saying, I'm old, white, a Westerner and a man. You know, and he just kind of like, what what have I got to say to you? You know, clearly looking out on an extremely diverse group of people. Um, and he started with a real kind of humility. And the, the whole thing is a real um, expression of his thinking about power, thinking about trust, thinking about, you know, how this how this synodal process is going to come together. Um, so it is a great reflection. Um, but what a what a great place to start. Mm -hmm place of place of humility um just one more question um right at the end well a, a couple of comments which i think come together actually um about sort of about clericalism but it's i i clericalism i think is one of those it's like a it's not it's a it's a power thing isn't it i think we i i would rather that we talked about power or weird attitudes to power than clericalism um because i think lay people get infected by it as well and get weird attitudes to, to things. But um, so so John McGowan says, you know, we we, we need to um, get priests who are clerical to think synodally, but also many laity. And then Maggie says, how can we help priests reach out to work synodally? Um, she says, there are priests who are afraid and don't allow the laity to help. So is that those kind of like how, you know, is there like a simple a simple tip or trick from either of you that you would say this could just help tip something or it could tip your perspective on this as to how how we deal with these issues well, I mean, it's frightening to work with groups yeah for some people more than others yeah um it's frightening to open the unknown so lots of times people move away from the unknown and 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 shut it because they're, they're scared of it if i don't know it if i can't hold it and handle it it's it's far too weird for me to go anywhere near it and therefore they actually avoid doing it so actually it's about unpacking that fear and helping people to understand there are processes and structures and ways of doing things that make this stuff easy mm -hmm. and um, and the more that you can the more you can relax into it the easier yeah but for some people we know that it's going to be difficult because they're going to find that hard so just recognizing that Avril is important 
and recognizing that for some people they need to be coached and encouraged and helped a lot more mm. and, and sometimes their resistance is actually not a resistance to the process that they want to been asked to do like maybe not a resistance to synodality but a resistance caused within them i can't do it yeah mm. i can't you know i don't know what to do i don't know it I can't touch it, I can't feel it, I can't understand it, and therefore people move away from it. Mm. Father Kevin, what... So formation is critical. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, my suggestion would be this, in answer to that particular question. I think that we have clergy retreats, and clergy study days, perhaps more clergy retreats, let's talk about that, or days of reflection. I think priests... Um, and we're such a diverse, diverse group of people, good people, but we're a diverse group of people. I think somehow uh, those should move away from a, a quite traditional uh, model of somebody sitting at the front talking to us and us going away. I think clergy retreats and so forth should be a synodal experience. Now, I, I, I wouldn't quite know just off the top of my head what that would be like. But I think it would be different. And I feel that we could model it really in, in many ways, um, uh, you know, with each other, with each other in a in a quite non-threatening, in a, you know, not an imposing way. But this is the way we, we do it. Mm. That would be my opinion. And it is, I think you're, I think that's a great idea because I do think once you've experienced one of these conversations working and, and you do experience it as a safe place and a, a place where you are heard and held, then it is quite, it's very exciting. And, and I, I, I've had a good experience of that just a few years ago before we talked about synodality too much when Bishop Peter was um, going to Rome to take part in the Synod and the Family. And he just brought together a, a group of us, quite a diverse, diverse, diverse group of people to talk about any issues, you know, around marriage and family life. It was an extraordinary experience. It really was. People felt very safe, going back to, to Kieran's point, felt very safe. They could say what they wanted and it would be listened to. And it was a very strong experience. So I think we can do it, but I think it has to be set up somehow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Kiran, I'm going to ask on the behalf of Celia, who is the author of the book on servant leadership? Servant leadership styles of Jesus Christ. If you don't. Gosh, can I get it out later on? Uh, we'll, we'll, I, we'll email every. We'll put it in the notes at the bottom. Yeah, there's of the several books on, on servant leadership. and uh, But that one, I can't remember. The, I can't never remember authors. Beauty of being dyslexic can remember very little. Hmm? <laughs> Listen, thank you to both of you so much. It's really been a fascinating conversation and so much um, that I think that we, we you know, I, I think talking about power in the church, like we have just done as being an ordinary thing that we all exercise and that gets exercised differently and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. That is a new experience for me as well, just being able to have those kind of free conversations. So I, I think this is, has been fascinating and it is one of the fruits of synodality I see um, as, as we go along. So I just want to say um, thank you for that. Thank you for a really fascinating evening. Thank you to all of you who have um, joined us this evening. Um, and um, I, if you are watching this on the recording, um, you can uh, also watch last week's, as I said, and please also feel free to share this around with people. It was lovely. It's always lovely to have people live. It's great. But I have to say, I get a sneaky joy out of um, looking at the numbers going up over the week and thinking, oh, some more people have been watching this, which is fantastic. Next time, um, next week, same time, same place, we welcome the two co-moderators of the Archdiocese of Liverpool Synod, um, which is Father Philip Inch and Father Matthew Nunes talking about what they learned from five years of doing synodality in their diocese. And um, they are great storytellers, <clears throat> um, a, a really, really very reflective, wise guys, um, and they've got some fantastic practical wisdom to share with us. Um, so in the meantime, you can find lots of resources on practicing synodality on our website. Um, 
scoffsynodality.org.uk and lots of things about some of those good and bad habits and 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 how and also how to have good conversations uh, which you might find useful do share this webinar with anyone you think would be interested and we'll see you again next week good night and god bless thank you very much everybody <laughs>